uh, John told him, apparently Fred said, well, get on with it. Twenty years later, John got a Nobel Prize in 1997, and the formal uh, uh, kind of description is elucidation of the enzymatic mechanism underlying the synthesis of adenosine triphosphate ATP. John's always been a very loyal supporter of BBS, as many people know that he had, um, and he, of course, he is a, an honorary member of, of BBS. And his opening lecture is absolutely perfect for the Congress and to put us in the right frame of mind. The respiratory enzyme chain, a triumph for Biosix John. Tony for that uh, kind uh, introduction. So uh, I've chosen as the topic of my lecture the respiratory chain, which I've studied now for more than, more than 30 years. And I think it does have a number of features that have made it particularly difficult. And uh, one of them was uh, the conceptual framework in which bioenergetics has uh, and the respiratory chain has developed. Uh, in, a, in the context of Peter Mitchell's chemiosmotic hypothesis, which certainly, uh, when I began, was still uh, controversial. Um, the, the other aspects, I think, that have made this a particularly difficult to, topic to study is the complexity uh, of the enzymes them, the, themselves, as you'll see. Uh, and in addition, they're membrane bound, which adds another level of complexity. Uh, and in some cases, they're also uh, extremely uh, dynamic. And although we've not arrived yet at a complete uh, understanding, whenever will we, uh, of, of the respiratory chain, nonetheless, I think if, if one looks back over a period of 30 years, one can see really huge advances uh, in this uh, field. And so that's really uh, what, what I want to talk to you about. Now, I could, of course, uh, equally talked about photosynthesis, another triumph for, for uh, biophysics. Equally difficult uh, to, to, to study for, for many of the reasons that I've just given. And uh, the recent elucidation of, of the structure and mechanism of the water splitting complex is really a, a major uh, advance in, in, in biophysics and, and biology that will undoubtedly have uh, huge implications uh, for, 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 for the future of mankind in terms of of energy uh, conversion, but anyway, that's uh, a lecture for another day. So I, I think that the, the, these are some of the key points about the, the development of, of this field. The first one, which goes back a long way to the 1960s, was actually the, the demonstration that the respiratory chain in mitochondria could be separated out uh, into separate uh, respiratory uh, complexes with defined biochemical activities. Uh, and, and then, of course, came uh, at, at, alongside this uh, came the development of the idea of, of chemiosmosis, which I'll come to in a moment. And then, also hand in hand with this, in relation to the respiratory complex in the mitochondria, uh, the definition of the mitochondrial genome uh, that, that was also uh, a, a landmark. So, the, the, the person really responsible for defining uh, biochemically defined those spiritual complexes. As many of you may not have heard of, he's David Green, and he was at the en Enzyme Institute here in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. And with his colleagues, he was able to separate out what we now call respiratory complexes, one, two, three, four, and five, uh, using uh, biochemical uh, methods. Uh, Green uh, is often remembered as somebody with very wacky ideas who made many uh, huge mistakes, and he did. Uh, but but I, I, I still maintain that this really was uh, a major step forward uh, in biochemical terms uh, in this field. And then the, the other two people, I just want to mention that I'm not sure already, is Peter Mitchell uh, for developing uh, the chemiosmotic uh, theory, because he received the Nobel Prize in 1978, and then uh, Fred Sanger uh, for his uh, work in developing DNA sequencing methods, which 
uh, along the way led to the, um, the elucidation of the mitochondrial uh, genome. So let, let's just briefly discuss Mitchell's genealogy uh, idea. So uh, Mitchell, uh, what Mitchell really demonstrated was that the energy intermediate in, in, uh, in, en uh, in energy conversion was what he called the proton motive force, uh, delta mu h plus. Uh, and delta mu h plus, he showed, uh, had two components, the difference in membrane potential across the membrane, uh, so in this case, the membrane of the mitochondria, uh, and the, the difference in pH across that membrane. Now, in, in mitochondria, uh, uh, this is by far the, the, the dominant term. And there is a voltage across the inner membranes of your mitochondria of almost minus 200 uh, millivolts. So effectively, uh, the, the proton motive force is a, is a voltage. And the, the pH term is, is very minor. There's only about 0.2 pH units difference across uh, your mitochondrial membranes. Whereas, whereas in chloroplasts, it, it, it's the converse. This term is dominant, and this term uh, is minor. And so Mitchell's idea was that the, the proton motive force, so he, he called it proton motive force by direct analogy with the electron motive force that we're more familiar with uh, in electricity. And instead of electricity, he talked about proticity. And the, the, the coining of these phrases people found difficult, and Mitchell would introduce these terms without explaining to them, so he very rapidly lost his audience. And this was really part of uh, one part of the problem that he had in getting his ideas uh, accepted. And so he said, proton motive force can be generated uh, by respiration in the way we're going to look at, uh, or by photosynthesis, or in this special case, by uh, bacteria, rhodopsin, taking light energy and generating proton motive force. And once you've generated it, it is a form of potential energy uh, and you can do several things with it. You can simply convert it to heat. And that's what happens, for example, uh, in hibernating animals. They uncouple uh, their mitochondria by opening a channel, uh, by producing a channel, and then the proton motive force generates heat. It provides the energy for uh, membrane transport of uh, ions, sugars, and proteins through hydrophobic barriers. It provides the energy for driving uh, the rotation uh, of the bacterium flagella, and of course it provides the energy for driving the formation of adenosine triphosphate from ADP and phosphate. And then to come to the mitochondrial genome, uh, I'm getting slightly ahead of myself here, here it is, the human mitochondrial genome, almost 17 kilobases. It took 15 people about two and a half years to determine the, the sequences of the, the, the sequences of 17 kilobase circular double stranded DNA molecule. And it, it encodes 13 proteins, they're shown in colored blocks here around the edge. They're all extremely hydrophobic uh, proteins. So mitochondria uh, are made of about 1,500 to 2,000 proteins. All the other ones are nuclear gene products that are imported. And these 13 have been sequestered and maintained uh, in the mitochondrial genome. Now, as you know, there, we now know that they're all part of respiratory complexes. This one is, is part of saccharin B, it's part of the BC1 complex. The ones in blue are part of complex 1, with our country in the moment. Uh, the yellow ones are part of saccharin C oxidase, and these two are part of the ATPase complex. And what I did when I was working with SANG was to identify this segment and show the, uh, the, the, the identity of these uh, genes. Uh, and then, in addition, uh, the mitochondrial genome uh, encodes two large RNAs, 16S RNA, 12S RNA, uh, which are components of the mitochondrial ribosome uh, that Alexei Ammons is going to talk about later uh, in this meeting. So, mitochondria have their own system for uh, replicating the DNA, for transcribing it, and for translating it. Uh, and they, therefore they have their own ribosomes, their own uh, 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 amino acid, TRNAs, and so forth. And all of those proteins, of course, are part of the 2,000 that are being brought 
into the mitochondria and assembled with these RNA molecules that are made inside uh, the mitochondria. And then the other genes that are in this genome are 22 tRNAs depicted as spheres here, uh, which are interspersed between the, the genes encoding proteins and the, the large RNA molecules. And those 22 tRNAs are a minimal set required to translate uh, the, 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 the mitochondrial uh, <coughs> And so the, these 13 proteins, none of them is modified post-translationally. Amazingly, today, the functions of only three of them uh, are well established. Of course, we have some notions about eight others. We know which complexes they're in. Uh, it's true for all of them. Uh, but exactly what they're doing, we, we don't yet know. And, uh, and for two of them, there's no, no clear role, whatever. ATPase 8 and cytochrome oxidase 3. Nobody has any clue, really, what they're doing. Uh, now, the other important feature of the development of this field of respiration, as many other fields, has been uh, the, de de the development of new experimental tools during the period of the development of this field. And so there, the, 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 this, 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 of course, could be much longer. There are, there are general tool, tools, spectroscopic methods, DNA cloning and sequencing, PCR, uh, cytorectal mutagenesis, omics, um, structural analysis methods, optical microscopy, x-ray, cryo-electron microscopy, you're going to hear a lot about this meeting, uh, single molecule methods. And the, the people who worked in this field have also been pretty inventive, and they uh, invented some of their own tools, the oxygen electrode, for example. Stop flow was invented uh, in uh, this, this field, uh, and, and also the double beam UV vis uh, uh, spec uh, spectroscopic methods. Uh, and most importantly, the crystallization of membrane proteins was also uh, a, a, a methodology that was developed uh, in this field. I'll come to that in a moment. So the person who developed stock flow was pretty chance. He actually started building the instrument whilst he was in Cambridge during the Second World War and, and carried on with that work at the Johnson Foundation, sorry, in Philadelphia. And, and he also did a lot of work on something I don't have time to explain called uh, Peter ratios, which are highly significant in this field. The person who uh, invented or solved the problem of how to crystallize membrane proteins was Hartmut Bickel, shown here uh, in the middle. Uh, he, the, the, the first membrane protein to be crystallized was the first synthetic reaction sent from Rotosudum monos viridis, solved with uh, Dyson Hoffer and Robert Huber. And uh, this was published in. Uh, 1989, and they actually received the Nobel Prize in 1988 uh, for uh, this work. Now let, let's turn to the mitochondria. So, again, our concept of what a mitochondria is has changed uh, over this 30 year period. So, this is the sort of picture one saw in textbooks, and actually still finds in textbooks of uh, the mitochondria depicted as something looking like. Uh, uh, a bacteria with its highly invaginated uh, inner membrane, which of course is where all these energy converting respiration events uh, occur. And then the larva uh, is grouped through pictures like this, showing the, uh, uh, the Christae mitochondrialis, as, as we call them. Whereas today, this, this is how we view mitochondria, so thanks to uh, improved optical microscopy and, and uh, the fluorescent methods. We now know that mitochondria extend throughout the body of the cells, and this is part of a, of a fibroblast, and this is up here, and these are the mitochondria, forming a kind of reticulum that actually extends throughout most of the cytoplasm of the cell. And you can see it's dynamic. There are bits uh, that, that break off, and but off, make these schools, and they, uh, then they rejoin the, 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 the reticulum. Uh, and the, the mitochondria is in a dynamic state uh, between the vesicular and fused uh, forms. And so exactly what a, an individual mitochondria is within this kind of structure, I think, is moot. And uh, you can ask questions like, where, where are the DNA molecules? And actually, we, we don't know, but probably 
300 DNA molecules in a, in a typical uh, cell. So the concept, what mitochondrion is, in cell biological terms has, has evolved. Now, I need to take you quickly through the beginning of your biochemical training, just to remind you that sugars and fats uh, are broken down inside the mitochondria, so the sugars of get broken down by glycolysis, producing pyruvate, and pyruvate is taken up into mitochondria, converted to acetyl-CoA by pyruvate dehydrogenase, using the Krebs cycle, and out of the Krebs cycle come reducing equivalents in the form of NADH and uh, FADH2. And uh, somewhat similarly, fats get taken into mitochondria by their ASAR chains being uh, attached uh, to the fault of CoA, but then transferred to carnitine. Then ASAR carnitine is actively taken up in exchange for internal carnitine. And uh, once it's inside the ASAR group, it transfers back onto CoA and you regenerate ASAR-CoA, so it's a, a shuttle mechanism for getting ASAR-CoA uh, across this membrane. And then that feeds into the beta oxidation pathway. Out of that comes more acetyl-CoA, feeds into this pathway, and more uh, reducing equivalents. And then the, the, the reducing equivalents feeding uh, to the electron transport chain complexes 1, 3, and 4 here for the NA electrons from NADH are feeding in here, and then electrons from succinate feed in uh, via complex 2 succinate dehydrogenase, which is not, at least three of the uh, uh, proton complex devices, this is not, uh, but uh, you can see that ubiquinone is bound here in the membrane domain, the electrons get transferred to ubiquinone, and then that contributes to the reduced quinone pool uh, in uh, the membrane. So what I'm now going to talk to you about is, is the respiratory complexes and the ATPS complex. So these, these three are generating the proton motor force. They're taking the redox energy produced in what I just described, and they're using it to translocate protons uh, from the inside space to the outside space, generating Mitchell's proton motor force, and then the, the ATPS complex uses that energy uh, to generate ATP inside the mitochondria, and since the ATP is the fuel for all of biology, it has to be shuttled out and made available in the rest of the cell, and that uh, is brought about by uh, a transport protein called ATP ATP translocase, which belongs to a family of transport proteins, but it's only found in mitochondria. It's not been found in any other source, including any uh, bacteria. And related to it is another member of the same family called the phosphate carrier. Uh, so that what this one does is it exchanges external ATP, so spent fuel is brought back to group which is rephosphorylated uh, into ATP. And this one's bringing back the other element of spent fuel phosphate uh, it, uh, to provide the other substrate for forming uh, ATP. Now, you'll, you'll notice here at the end of the respiratory chain uh, that Dr. Uh, Oxygen is reduced to water, so that's one of the things that saccharum C oxidase does. We know how much oxygen we breathe in every day, and so from that we can calculate how much ATP each of us makes every day. It's about 60 kilograms of ATP is made by each of us uh, by this process. So let's now uh, concentrate uh, on the respiratory chain and uh, talk to you. First of all, about complex one. I won't say too much about uh, complexes two, three, uh, and four. They've been uh, well described. Uh, their mechanisms are really quite well known, uh, although there's still some argument about how saccharin C oxidase works. I'll talk primarily about now the rest of the talk about complex one uh, and the ATPS complex. And so the mammalian complex, which I started to study. 1989, we now know we've made 44 polypeptide chains of combined molecular mass of omega dolphin. It's probably the biggest enzyme known other than the ribosome, and there's actually more protein in this complex than there is in a particular ribosome, of course, it's not the RNA. And uh, if, if one uh, if characterizes as other people do, uh, complex one from bacteria, from that, uh, we could deduce, as I did, that 
15 uh, of the, these 44 polypeptide chains contain the business end, and they're involved uh, in the catalytic uh, processes which are, are come to. So they're conserved in new bacteria. And the other 29 are what we call supernumerary subunits. So many of them uh, are, made, are conserved throughout the carrier, but they have no, uh, uh, no obvious role uh, in the, the activity of complex one. So what complex one is doing is taking electrons from NADH and using it to reduce uh, coenzyme Q, as I'll show you, and uh, to generate a proton, to force by protein protons. So there are 28, 29 proteins that are part of this complex. They're conserved in the carrier, and yet they're not part uh, of, of this process. Now, the functions, uh, for the most part, are unknown, although we've now shown that one of them is certainly an assembly factor for, for this uh, enzyme. I don't have time to describe the assembly process, but as you can imagine, it's rather complicated. Seven proteins are made inside. Thirty-seven of them are coming from outside. They're put together into this complex, and you've also got to put in uh, prosthetic groups uh, as well. And so there are, we're now realizing that there are many other proteins not part of the complex that are involved in this process. And some of these, uh, uh, at least one of the supernumerary subunits is also uh, involved. And uh, some of them have uh, human pathogenic mutations associated with them, indicating that they must be important in a certain way that we don't understand it. Now, the structure of the complex one has been pioneered by my colleague uh, Leonid Sazanov, so he studied uh, by X-ray crystallography predominantly the, the, as it were, the simpler uh, uh, core complex from uh, bacteria from E. coli and thermosynoptics. And the first structure to produce was of the peripheral arm. I forgot to point out that complex one is an L-shaped structure. It's got an extrinsic arm shown here, and that's attached to a membrane arm which lies orthogonal uh, 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 to it. And so this was the structure of the extrinsic arm. Uh, with the NADH binding site is up here. And what uh, happens is that the electrons are transferred one at a time uh, to non covalent glass bound fled, uh, uh, fled in mononucleotide. And then they, they pass quickly by quantum electron tunneling down a chain of uh, se uh, seven ion sulfur clusters uh, uh, down to this terminal uh, uh, member of the chain, cluster uh, M2. And N2, as you'll see in a moment, sits next to the quinone. And so this is the center that transfers the, the electrons to the, to the, to the And these numbers here indicate the distances. Uh, the, uh, these are uh, center to center distances here, and edge to edge distances. And these are appropriate distances for electrons to be transferred by quantum electron tunnel. Now, there are two other kinds of across like this one here, which is in, in, in an appropriate uh, location to receive Electrons, it, it almost certainly does, but what it's doing is a matter of debate. So, this is the main electron chain, and then the seventh one is too far away. It could take about 10,000 years for an electron to tunnel uh, from here uh, to, to here. This seems to be a, to have a structural uh, role. So, that's the extrinsic arm. So, all, all the extrinsic arm is it's 100 omstroms high, and it contains. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in this particular complex, I think about eight or nine uh, polypeptide chains in the, in the human complex, there are 20 odd polypeptide chains. All it's doing is to provide a wire to connect uh, NADH down to the genome. And why, why did it evolve, why it evolved in that kind of way is, is, is pretty mysterious, I think. You think why, why, why don't you just put the NADH next to the, next to the genome? get rid of that, that wire. But anyway, that's the way it's evolved. And uh, uh, another important development has been a, a theoretical background to biological uh, electron transfer mechanisms that was provided by Rudy Marcus with his uh, Marcus theory. So Marcus received the Nobel Prize, I think, in 1992 for developing that. And then um, an empirical way of estimating whether um, redox 
centers were appropriately placed in terms of their distance apart was the development of the, the so-called Dutton Moser ruler, which was uh, is based upon uh, distances uh, between redox centers in known structures. This is the here. And then more recently, uh, Leonid Sazanoff has continued his brilliant work on the bacterial complex and has solved now the, the whole complex. So here's the extrinsic arm I've just described. And now a membrane arm, which you can see is chock full of uh, alpha helices, helices. And interestingly, there's an, another helix uh, which lies orthogonal to them in the plane uh, of the membrane. But we know, we'll see in a moment, is in this uh, region here, in the interface between the membrane and, and the extrinsic region. And uh, this region here is where the protons are pumped. And for each two electrons arriving at this site singly, somehow four uh, uh, protons are expelled uh, from top uh, to bottom. And that's the nub. That's really what we're trying to understand is the coupling, uh, energy coupling, between this reduced site and the pumping of protons. And that is certainly not understood uh, today. Now, uh, Sazanov's original idea was that the energy uh, was uh, transmitted to this part of the structure uh, by this helix moving backwards and forwards, rather like a steam engine. Uh, but uh, that idea was tested has uh, been largely abandoned. Uh, but what there is in this region uh, of the membrane arm uh, are, th are three domains that look like sodium proton antiporter uh, proteins. They have a broken helix, they have broken helices in the middle of the membrane. Uh, and there's something in common between the way protons are being pumped uh, in this enzyme. Uh, and so there are three, three such domains here here and here, so that probably each of them accounts for the pumping of one proton. proton. And the, the, the thought is now that the fourth proton is, is somehow pumped uh, in this region here. As, now, uh, this depicts, I think, better what's going on. So there's NADHF and then the chain of ion sulfur clusters. Here's the quino uh, lying uh, in, sorry, here, lying in the face region. And, and the problem is, is to connect the reduced quinone to the rest of it and make it, uh, make it pump uh, uh, protons. And uh, it's an un unsolved problem. Uh, Susanna has ideas about how it uh, might work. So this is his idea of the oxidized form where the four protons are being released. And then uh, once this site becomes uh, reduced to some sort of conformational change, it shuts off the bottom bit and allows uh, protons to go in and recharge uh, this sodium proton antiporter. But these are as yet uh, untested uh, ideas. But you know, if you think back to 1989 when I started to analyze this complex to today, the advance is, is, is simply huge. And uh, I, I think it's a great uh, tribute to, to, to Leonid Sasanov that he's managed uh, to do uh, what he's done. Um, I quickly zip through uh, 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 complex three, such as BC1. As I said a few moments ago, we understand pretty well how this works, largely uh, based upon Peter Mitchell's ideas of what we call uh, the Q cycle. I won't go into that. Uh, but there, there is, interestingly, uh, there is a mobile part of, of BC1 complex, part of the risky ion sulfur protein knots backwards and forwards and carries electrons, rather like an escapement mechanism uh, in a clock. So they're, they're not all completely solid state uh, devices. And then this is cytochromacy oxidase. It's actually the first respiratory enzyme that is structure sold by Yoshikawa and company uh, in 1996. Um, you can see it's a dimeric structure. Uh, there are 13 polypeptides in each half. Uh, the, the, the proton the, 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 a metal center here uh, and there are access pathways to that center and egress pathway and so forth. And 
And to, to, to a large extent, it, it, it's understood uh, what's going on. And uh, uh, Nicol and others solved uh, structures, again, of minimal um, bacterial complexes. So this is of a three core protein. So cytochrome C is again, three core proteins and 10 supernumerary subunits. Again, nobody knows about what they're there for. Uh, so let's come to the ATPase complex that I worked on. So <coughs> the first pictures of it were taken in the 1960s by electron microscopists uh, using negative stain. And they're looking at inverted vesicles from bovine heart mitochondria. They could see that the vesicles were studded uh, with structures they referred to as lollipops or mushrooms. And the, the, the features of that lollipop was a head and then a, 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 a stalk attaching the head to the membrane. In other words, the head is not in contact directly uh, with, with the membrane itself. These are more recent pictures taken by Bukemar uh, in Groningen. And they, they showed di uh, uh, dimeric ATPase complexes. So here's one dimer here attached in the membrane domain here. Um, and the dimers are arranged in rows. We now think uh, that these rows of ATPases extend all the way around the edge of the Christi. And the, the, the Christi in mitochondria are like flattened balloons with the ATPases around the edge and all the other respiratory complexes in the, and the transport proteins in the flattened area. And so um, it, it seems that, uh, uh, that, that these dimeric structures are uh, an essential component for forming uh, the Christi inside mitochondria. If you remove the dimerizing capacity, you lose the, the Christi structure, the, the, and the mitochondria look like onions, it's the concentric layers of, 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 of membranes. Um, now, what I did with my colleagues was built up a molecular structure of the ATPS complex, so as you know, it's a rotary machine. Here's the rotor. In reality, it's going around anywhere between 500 to over 1,000 per second. So this is slowed down. And uh, the rotation is driven by the energy released by protons going through the interface region between the rotor ring and this part here. This is the catalytic part where substrates, ATP and phosphate, are going in as there into a catalytic interface. You'll notice it closes, then ATP forms. And the, the most important feature uh, is that makes it work is that the rotor is asymmetrical. If it was symmetrical, the enzyme wouldn't work. And so the, the asymmetrical rotor turns around and, and changes the conformational states of each of the three catalytic sites residing within its complex. And then here down the side is what we call a peripheral stalk. So the peripheral stalk plus we propose that the the enzyme worked by mechanism based upon looking at X-ray structures. They demonstrated the, the rotation visually in a, in, a, in a light microscope. So they took the catalytic part here, so it's upside down relative to what I've been talking about, and then biostreptavidin attached an actin filament from biostreptal fibers uh, to, to, to the rotor. And then in the presence of ATP, they could see the actin going around that light of the color. And then in more recent manifestations, the, 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 the actin is very big relative to the machine and it slows it down to the rotation speed of about one per second. And so this has been re replaced by gold beads in recent experiments as depicted here. So although the bead is, you can see, 30 times bigger than the ATPase, it will still rotate it at speeds of, of 1 to 2. Uh, 200, even up to 500 per, per, per second. And uh, there, there are many such uh, experiments that have been done to measure the torque and, and other biophysical characteristics uh, of this motor to, to, to try and understand how it works and, and also to try and marry together the structural information with these uh, experiments. That's still problematical, actually. And the reason for that is that the Rotation experiments have all been done up in bacterial systems until recently all the structural work was done on mitochondrial systems and we've just realized in the last year 
that they have a different, uh, that the mitochondrial bacterial enzymes have a different growth cycle. And so I think this problem will be resolved in the next year or two. That's just one of the pictures that show one of the propellants, the actinfluence of uh, going brown. And in the hyperlytic <coughs> mode, they're, they're all going in the counterclockwise direction. Now, so the other experiments I won't show you have been done where uh, people have attached uh, magnetic beads, driven them in the opposite sense in the intact enzyme uh, using uh, a magnetic field uh, and dem they demonstrated uh, the synthesis of ATP. <coughs> so I want now to, so I've got, we're faced with this problem of, uh, of solving the rest of the structure, the ATPase complex. And, and we, until, until recently, X-ray crystallography has been by far the dominant uh, way uh, of doing this, and of course it's still got a lot of uh, mileage. Uh, but what, uh, what we've seen over the last few years is the development uh, of cryo-electron microscopy, particularly at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. And uh, so I'll just say a little bit about this. So th this is a field of uh, 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 part of purified bovine ATCs in detergent. Uh, and what has happened is that uh, this solution has been applied uh, to a poly uh, carbon electron microscope grid and frozen, flash frozen in liquid ethane. This produces vitreous ice with the particles uh, embedded in them. And the particles, there's sufficient contrast between the uh, the particles in the background that you can actually detect them uh, without uh, the stain. So in this field you'll see the ADPS complex in many different orientations. You can pick these particles and then classify them into different groups and then average the particles in each group and produce these different views. So this one, the peripheral stalks on the left, this glass is on the right, and in this one, the peripheral stalk is round the back and obscured. And so you can use this information uh, to build up the three-dimensional image and increasingly uh, at atomic uh, res resolution. So this just explains the principles, I think, from an article that Richard Henderson wrote. So here's the object that you're studying. You produce these different uh, 2D projections. From that, you make a 2D Fourier transform. And from there, uh, a 3 d uh, Fourier transform, then you invert it and you can then generate the original uh, object. Uh, as I say, at that, if, if the data are good enough, then uh, at the top resolution. So we started using this approach some years ago in, in collaboration with Richard Henderson and with the former PhD student, John Rubenstein, who is now an independent investigator in Toronto. And uh, so John's student, Lindsay Baker, and John, with assistance from people in my group, picked 60,000 particles of the bovine enzyme. It took two years to do this and to process them. And, and we came up with this map of the bovine APPAs at 17 or so resolution. Sounds pretty modest. But there was an awful lot of information uh, in this image you'd want to see the protein boundaries without difficulty, so we colored them in. Uh, but it wasn't difficult to see that these were alpha, these were alpha proteins, these were beta proteins. You could see the, 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 the central stalk of the rotor, you could see the rotor ring in the membrane, and you could see the peripheral stalk in green. And most interestingly uh, came the first image of the missing part of the structure. Here's this is shown in cross section here. And uh, what, what it, it seems to indicate is that there is a, a, a contact point, rather like in an electrical motor, where the protons must be delivered to the ring and, and, uh, and also exit up onto the model uh, in a minute. Now, now recent, the recent advances uh, are now mean that it's possible to study protein complexes even uh, below 200 kilodaltons and start approaching the resolution by this proposal. Now this is due to the, 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 first of all, the introduction of direct electron uh, detectors. So previously, 
the electrons were detected indirectly as, as light. Yeah, but in the new detectors, uh, it's, they're detected uh, directly. This increases signal to noise when it's, it's fast. And uh, image collection is also extremely fast. You can collect them as movies. And that means you get better quality data because the impact of the beam on the, on the object make, makes them move. But if you collect the images quickly enough, that reduces that movement. Then, and you get better quality and then, of course, hand in hand with this has come vastly improved uh, computational methods. So, with the help of, uh, of Vina Kumar, we, we recently looked at uh, an ATPA's complex from a thermophilic bacteria. It's not very thermophilic, but it's Fischia and Worcester. Um, and within two weeks, and um, by, by picking only 10,000 particles, so better quality uh, particles, this image was uh, of the ATPS complex was uh, uh, calculated and it, it's got much more detail in it than the one I just showed you. You can, you can see that there, in the peripheral stalk, for example, you can see that, uh, that there are two helices twisting around each other. And we haven't bothered really to try and interpret as it were the internal regions of this. We, we could do that because we're now striving to get this to higher resolution by picking uh, more particles. So this is really a major break, breakthrough, not just in this field, uh, but in other fields as well. As I've said already, you're going to see other examples. For example, Alexei Ammons is going to talk about the mitochondrial ribosome that he solved uh, using this, uh, this procedure. So let me come now to the differences between bacterial and mitochondrial enzymes. It's something I've studied for a very long time. So the simpler ones, as I've said already, the bacterial ones, then chloroplasts, have got the core uh, set of subunits, the cathodic part, the, the rotor and the rotor ring, the A protein that we're still starting to get information about, and then here's the peripheral stalk. Well, Exactly the same complex is found in mitochondrial enzymes, the epic part, the rotor, the ring, although you'll notice the ring sizes are not constant, I'll come back in a minute. There's a peripheral stalk, it's actually uh, rather diverged, the, the peripheral stalks are rather diverged in terms of their composition and structure, but they're functionally uh, the same. Uh, but in addition, in the mitochondrial enzyme, again, we have a set of supernumerary supplements, EFG, A6L, DAPIT 6.8, protein 6. Um, seemingly innocuous, uh, rather boring proteins put on one side, ignored because they have nothing uh, to do with making ATP. I'll come to that uh, shortly. So this is the way we think uh, rotation could be generated. So here's the rotor ring in the membrane. It's made of proteins called C, so this model has 12 C proteins in it. Each C has a carboxyl group exposed uh, in the middle uh, of, of, of the membrane. And the C is in, in uh, contact with the uh, enigmatic uh, A protein here. It's imagined that A has a half channel that allows protons on the outside to access negatively charged carboxyl groups here in this in interface that would neutralize them. And then simply through Brownian motion, the neutralized carboxyl, which of course is more hydrophobic, would prefer to be here, so it just moves here by ground inversion. That brings another negative charge uh, that gets neutralized, and so, and so they get carried around the rim. There's more protons going here uh, until they reach this point here, where it's imagined the protein uh, structure has the property of the box, so we re release the proton, regenerate the negative charge. And the thing that makes this unit, you, you don't need a ratchet to make this, uh, a physical ratchet to make this unidirectional. Remember, there's minus 200 milli millivolts across this structure, and so there's a huge pressure of protons into this uh, half channel, and that pushes it around in the synthetic direction. Now, you remember that the rotor ring is attached to this stalk going up in the catalytic part. And I, I did mention and emphasize it that the cathodic part, part has three cathodic sites. So every time the ring goes through 360 degrees, you produce 
three ATPs are here. Now, if there were 12 proteins in the ring, you'd require 12 protons to rotate the ring through 360 degrees, and therefore the number of protons to make an ATP would be 12 divided by 3, maybe 4. And we, we now know in general terms that the proton ATP ratio is a very important number direct, directly related to the P to O ratio that I mentioned at index play at the beginning. Um, <coughs> that that it, it's not, a, it's not a, a constant, it differs, as we found, from, uh, uh, through species. So what we found is that in metazoans, um, the rings have eight-fold symmetry. In yeast, they have ten-fold symmetry. And then other people <coughs> have shown that in eubacteria, you can have symmetries anywhere from 10 to 15. <coughs> and in spinach chloroplast and 14 fold symmetry. So, so that means that the, the amount of energy that you're paying to make an ATP varies between the species. And so we pay the least of the metazoa. We pay 2.7 protons per uh, ATP. Now, if you look at the structures of these rotors, they're drawn to scale in cross section. <coughs> you can see that physically they're, they're very different. So this is us with our C8 rings. This is uh, the, the, the rotor ring in a cyanobacterium. So the cyanobacterium has to pay five protons to rotate the ring uh, and uh, 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 sorry, 15 protons to rotate the ring, five protons to each uh, AT, uh, ATP plate. And so the question has arisen, why are there all these different uh, ring sizes, and we think that the answer could be, if it's not proven at all, uh, is that these uh, bacteria live in relatively energetically impoverished circumstances. They're not able uh, to generate a high proton motive force, and so they have to opt for uh, driving what is effectively a low gear. So this is a low gear in the motor, this is a high gear. We can drive the high gear because we've got minus 200 millivolts to drive it. Sinecococcus, uh, it's argued, uh, has a lower uh, proton effective force, and so it has to opt for a, a larger ring size. And people are testing that uh, idea at, at, at present. But I, I still find it surprising that, uh, as we have had plenty of time to show you the evidence, that the C8 ring persists throughout metazones from man down to peripheral of sponges. And, uh, but then there's a transition. Once you move to unicellular organisms, you start to take uh, more energy and build a bigger ring. Now, so, so bacterial and mitochondrial ATPases differ in the ring size and the amount of energy to make an ATP. They also differ in the way they're regulated. And I won't describe how bacterial enzymes are regulated. I'll just talk about it. The and I just wanted to remind you that many proteins are intrinsically disordered and are unfolded. And the property of intrinsically disordered proteins is often they're heat stable, they contain a high number of charge residues, few bulk amino acids, and they're often involved in regulatory mechanisms and they'll bind uh, to more than one uh, part and form more than one structure. And the, the protein that regulates the ATPase in mitochondria is called IF1 inhibitor of F1 ATPase. It's heat stable, it has a high charge number of a high number of charge residues, few bulky residues. It's predicted uh, to be intrinsically unfolded and it's set in half spectrum. Most importantly, it demonstrates that it is uh, this, this, this all. Now we had some years ago, solved the structure of the inhibitor protein on its own, so we've grown crystals of it. And, and it actually made fibers within, within the, the crystals, so that these regions, which, so the inhibitory part is here and here, is a dimeric active inhibitor protein. And, and this part we now know is the intrinsically uh, disordered part, and this part is uh, formed this. Alpha and parallel alpha beautiful world. Well, but in, in the crystals, uh, this intrinsically unfolded part becomes structured, and so we were able to solve the structure show here. And moreover, we took the, that same region, uh, so we chopped off the bit that made the coil to coil, and we solved the inhibited, uh, inhibited uh, enzyme complex. 
and the inhibitor sits in a cathodic interface. It goes through a very complex tunnel, interacts with five of the nine polypeptide chains in the enzyme, and wraps itself around the ro rotor. So, as I've said many times before, crudely speaking, it's rather like sticking a stick in a bicycle. You push this inhibitor in, the machine grinds to a halt. And in order to form the inhibited complex, you have to hydrolyze to ATP molecules. So the idea about this protein is that uh, under uh, conditions where you've got plenty of oxygen, the respiratory chain works, the proton motive force, ATP is churned out by the ATPs. But under anoxic conditions, for example, during an ischemic heart attack, uh, the enzyme would start to run backwards because you'd start to make uh, ATP by glycolysis this would acidify the mitochondria and you'd lose the proton motive force. The enzyme would hydrolyze ATP. But what happens is that this protein, which is very abundant in mitochondria, is in a normally quiescent state where it's forming large aggregates. And once the pH drops to about 7, the aggregates come apart and it activates the dimer. And, and then it inserts itself into the enzyme and stops it from hydrolyzing any more uh, ATP molecules. And so what, what, one of the things we did once we solved that structure was to uh, mutate uh, every residue in the alpha helical region and also the terminus single to alanine. We measured K on and K off in, in every case. And it became clear that there were residues in this alpha helix which were not in contact with the enzyme in the inhibitive complex. And we call those group two residues. So these are depicted here. So they're not in contact with the, with the enzyme. They're sitting in aqueous spaces. And uh, again, if you knock them out, the inhibitor won't work. And uh, so I wondered what, what they were doing and thought, well, yeah, they probably have a role in the formation of the inhibitor complex. So we wanted to know how does the inhibitor complex form? And so what we, to cut a long story short, we eventually grew crystals in the presence of a very large excess of inhibitor containing specific group 2 uh, mutations. And we found complexes with three inhibitors bound. And what we found was that, um, so these are, this is showing the three catalytic beta subunits of the enzyme. Here's the central stalk, the, the rotor. Uh, so this is the most open state, it's called the empty state, it has no ATP or ATP boundary. And uh, so the unfolded inhibitor comes along, starts to interact, and nucleates and forms a short helix uh, on the empty subunit. An ATP is then hydrolyzed, the, the central bit rotates for 120 degrees, the site starts to close, this then allows more of the alpha helix uh, to form. Another ATP is hydrolyzed, another 120 degree rotation, and now the fully inhibited uh, structure that we've seen before uh, can form. And so rather surprisingly, this was accepted two days ago in the PNAS, rather surprisingly we managed to trap folding intermediates in this pathway, folding the intrinsically inhibited protein by crystallography, something that my friend Alan Hirsch told me was completely <laughs> impossible. Um, but he now believes that it is possible. Um, now, there's another mechanism of AT, where ATPase is regulated, and this is a global uh, regulatory mechanism, and it's of extreme medical uh, importance. And it is mediated by something that's called the mitochondrial permeability transition port. So this phenomenon of the mitochondrial transition has been known for more than 30 years and it's depicted here uh, on the left. So if calcium is released into the cytoplasm of the cell, so this is showing calcium, for example, being re released in the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria will take up that calcium. They have proteins that will do this. This then increases the, the calcium concentration inside the mitochondria quite massively, and this will then trigger the opening of the pore in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and this is called the mitochondrial permeability transition pore. And once it, it's open, uh, this will disgorge the, the internal contents of the mitochondria, 
water will rush in, the mitochondria swell and they burst. And this is recognized as being the mechanism, probable mechanism, for triggering cell death by necrosis, not by apoptosis. Apoptosis is depicted on, on uh, the left. And so it has direct relevance to many human uh, diseases. And the question has been, what, is, what are the proteins that make the mitochondrial permeability transition for? And so, you know, I looked in some years ago, looked in nature. The permeability transition core is made of a dimeric uh, adenine nucleotide transporter. This is the ADP transfer case I mentioned earlier. Uh, in the inner membrane, in contact with the voltage dependent anion channel in the outer membrane with other proteins that uh, interact. This is complete nonsense. <laughs> uh, it's the way because. Uh, as we now demonstrated, the permeability transition core resides here in the membrane domain of the ATPS complex. And by suppressing the expression of the supernumerary proteins E, F, G, DAPID, 6.8 proteolipid, and also all of the peripheral stalk subunits one at a time, and gamma, and the individual proteins controls, what we now know is that these proteins are involved in the permeability transition core plus subunit B. Now this protein is encoded. So this is the protein that actually overlaps with the, the, uh, the gene. Its gene overlaps with the gene for subunit A we want to know about um, in the mitochondrial genome. And we, we've been able to eliminate this because you can make uh, you can, surprisingly, you can make cells that have no mitochondrial DNA. So they have no A, they have no A6 cell, but they actually still have a vestigial mitochondria, and that it, within that, you find a vestigial ATPase, and in that vestigial ATPase, there's still a permeability transition for it. So this is not part of it, this is not part of it, this is not part of it. There's a, there's a paper appeared in PNX this week saying this is a permeability transition for it. I don't think so. Um, and uh, now, I'll to summarize this. So each of these proteins has one predicted transmembrane helix. We don't know their stoichiometries, we're measuring them at the moment, but they generally seem to be one of each. And their orientations are not known properly. We actually we think they're all C turned or in. And the suppression of any, any one of them abolishes the CTP. Now, we can't write down a formula for the PTP at the moment because when we suppress G E, we also lose G from uh, the complex. It's, it's expressed but not assembled. And similarly with this protein, if we remove this one, we also lose this one. So, but the, P the permeability transition pore lies within this set of proteins somewhere, and we should know the answer uh, quite soon. And uh, so we think at the moment that all of these proteins plus B uh, could be involved. B has got two transmembrane proteins, A and C are uh, not uh, involved. And of course what we're going to do is determine the precise protein composition. Now the, the pore is regulated by a protein called cytophilin D, which is a prolyl cis trans isomerase. So this is the mitochondrial form of it. Uh, and, um, that this, this is the protein to which cyclosporin A binds. So once cyclosporin A binds to cyclosporin D, uh, that prevents the uh, core uh, opening. And uh, of course, we're interested in uh, working out how is with which protein is cyclosporin D interacting with. And we're, we're going to we are in the process of characterizing the proxy core. In the process now of determining the structure of the ADPAs, we're going to as a bonus, we should get this to the PTP. And we're already starting to develop the inhibitors because they are of intense uh, medical interest, as you can imagine. If you could induce necrosis or prevent uh, necrosis, this would, would uh, <coughs> find many uses uh, in medicine. So it, it's been, I've worked now on the ATPS since 1980. And Suddenly, in the last two or three years, it's given, the, the PTP has given it a new lease of life. We've almost got to the point of understanding in molecular terms, but not quite, how the 
uh, rotation uh, is generated. <coughs> and I think it's fair to say that um, on the basis of what I've said, that the structures of complexes one to four and that all the functional works really are landmarks in structural uh, biology that provides a framework uh, for studying uh, the details of their mechanisms. And uh, in, in future, these are the kinds of questions that need to be answered. So one of them is, are there supramolecular complexes in mitochondria? Uh, people have produced gel evidence that there are supramolecular complexes, but it's all one-dimensional, all based on one technique. I, I suspect that there, that there will be supramolecular complexes, but I think that the evidence is not clear. Whereas, of course, in chloroplasts, it's quite clear that there is a lot of organization of, of photosynthetic complexes in chloroplast method. And then there's a question that I touched on earlier, how, how they put together when you've got proteins coming from two uh, genomes, a particularly complicated issue. What are the roles of the supernumerary subunits? We've only begun uh, to, to scratch the surface there. And then I haven't talked about it, but I've actually worked on it quite a, a lot, is what are the role of lipids? Because we should stop thinking about these machines simply as proteins, because they are actually protein-lipid complexes. And the lipids themselves are an integral part of the activity of the enzyme, something that we're only just beginning to, uh, to study and understand. So, for example, it's been known for many, many years that cardiolipid is an essential component of ATPase. If you remove cardiolipid, the enzyme is not active. And we produced evidence that it's actually binding to the C ring. So what is it doing? So we, our ideas are it could be some sort of grease to grease the thousand per second rotation, or it could be stabilizing the ring, or remember cardiolipid has two negative charges, so it could actually be involved in proton translocation. So these are all open, open questions. So there's an awful lot more uh, to, 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 to be done. So I, I just want to acknowledge recent collaborator Sir John Basin has done all this work on the inhibitor, recent work on the inhibitor protein with Martin uh, Montgomery. I haven't mentioned the work of these people. They're the people I've actually done work on, on cardiolipid. And then the Jay E, Andrew Flores, and Joe Carroll have done the work on the permeability transition core. All of the X ray structures continue to be a collaboration with Andrew and Leslie. At the uh, laboratory of the Bala, where I was in 1998. And then in recent collaboration with Dino Kumar uh, in relation to the cryo electron microscopy, and also with John Rubenstein in Toronto. And then the, the, the simulations that I've done again uh, to study the interaction with Congolipi, and they've been done with Alan Robbins. And so I thank you all very much for coming to listen. Thank you very much, John. Truly inspiring. I wish you'd said a bit more about the lipids, but then that's okay. We can talk about that later. Um, I think in the interest of time, if that's okay, do you mind if we move on? And as Tim said, we have a very tight schedule. You'll be around for another hour or so, I think. Um, and uh, so for those of you who uh, would like to stay here for Stream 1, uh, the NMR and McDermott's lectures, and then the Think Lecture Theatre, Four. We're okay now to go back to the original position. The original one. So it's lecture theatre four, four, right? No, three. Maybe three. Three. Three and five. five. Three and five. Three. This is three. This is three. And perhaps the chairs should start their sessions at three o'clock, if that's yeah. okay. And then we'll be in sync for people who want to move behind. So thank you very much.